How can I help you become more successful? Hey everyone, and welcome to this new series. Uh, maybe it's a series, maybe it's a couple short videos here and there, but um, I'm gonna be calling this series the Assistance Chair. Now, if you've ever worked in a studio before in any capacity, you know, interned or been an assistant engineer, or even if you've just sat in on a session, you might be familiar with what I'm talking about when I say the assistance chair. This is that seat, it's in the back of the room, it's close enough to the engineer to change a patch if they need it, but not too close so they can stay focused on their work. It's the seat that's close enough to an artist to pass them a tissue if they need one, but still far enough that you're not like intruding on their creative process. It's the seat that's closest to the coffee machine and furthest from the Grammys, but I can assure you that if you master the art of sitting in this seat, you can also master the art of production and engineering. So with that being said, here are five tips to kickstart your career in audio. Tip number one, don't be afraid to humble yourself. Now this isn't the same as stay humble. I mean, really don't be afraid to take yourself down a peg. As an example, I'd like to read an excerpt from Jason Joshua's website. Now, if you don't know who Jason Joshua is, you need to fix that. Please do yourself a favor and follow this man on Instagram. Whether you're a producer, an engineer, an artist, the hashtags this man uses alone are enough to save your mix. But Jason didn't start out on top. Let's read closely. So this is Jason's website, and if we scroll down to his bio, we can read here, Jason got his start at a young age working at MCA and Motown under the mentorship of his godfather and Motown Records president, Gerald Busby. That was followed by brief solo stints at Sony and Red Ant. He ultimately landed a marketing A&R position at DreamWorks reuniting with his mentor, Mr. Busby. After being in the record business since he was 15 and looking for a new challenge, Jason was approached by MTV to work in new show development and programming for them. He jumped at the opportunity and quickly climbed the corporate ladder, handling advertising for his parent company, Viacom. While he was working with MTV Viacom, he ended up enrolling in the Los Angeles Recording Workshop and uh, taking you know, part-time audio classes. Now, if we continue reading down here, it says he soon took the technical groundwork that Los Angeles Recording Workshop provided and landed an internship at one of the premier mixing facilities in the country, Larrabee Recording Studios. Now, Larrabee is where people like Dave Way, Manny Marikin work out of. Now, if you don't know these people, you don't know that place, I implore you to look it up, but it's the next few sentences that are most important. He was basically starting over from scratch. He knew to truly become one of the best, he had to be around the best. I was taking out the trash, fluffing pillows, and picking up food for the same people who I had once to work with as a music executive. It was a different experience, but you cannot cheat success. So here's a man who was working as an A&R for DreamWorks, as a developer for MTV and Viacom, and then he decides to pack up his things and get coffee as a runner in a studio. But he's right, he's 100% he's right. You cannot cheat success. And part of that is being able to humble yourself and to do the work that other people just don't wanna do. You know, the work that you might think that you're better than. I can tell you from experience that if you become great at tackling like the small things in the studio, you'll sooner graduate to having more responsibility. If you can tackle the jobs that no one wants to do but handle them with poise and skill, people will be more likely to trust you with the work that everyone wants. Now you have to think about this from your employer's perspective, right? Do you want to hire the kid that thinks he's too good to make a cup of coffee? Or do you want to hire the kid that knows that you take your coffee with one sugar and oat milk? It's that level of detail that will get your employers to notice your work ethic. Every small job is an opportunity for you to learn and to grow. Right now, you might be getting coffee outside the room, but if you treat that cup of coffee with the same amount of respect you would an artist recording vocals, pretty soon you'll be inside the room changing patch cables, setting up microphones. At the end of the day, we all have humble beginnings. We all have to start from somewhere. Tip number two, become the best engineer in the worst room. Now you can think about this as kind of an extension of tip one, right? Just do the work that no one else really wants to do. Now, if you're interning at a studio and there's a B room, a C room, hell, if there's a Z room where they're booking like the smaller artists and it has like not the best equipment and it's just like an Apollo twin on a desk, you know, become the best engineer in that space. Take all of the jobs that you can take in that room. Know that room inside and out. When there's a problem, when they can't get signal in that room, someone else is working there, you know, something goes wrong, be the guy that they want to call. Again, no one else wants to take jobs in that room. So now you're filling a void at that studio. You're also putting your name in the staff's head as someone who's reliable in, you know, the least desirable situations. If you can handle yourself professionally with smaller and less prepared artists in the room that's the least sophisticated, they're gonna be more likely to trust you with the more sophisticated equipment and with more important artists. Tip number three, take good notes. 
Believe it or not, taking notes is actually a huge part of our jobs as engineers. Come up with a system that works for you so that you never drop a take in a session, or if you're recording, let's say, a vocalist for three or four hours, and they're like, okay, uh, which takes do you like? You can actually have an informed opinion and not have to sit there and scroll through hours and hours of vocal takes. But this goes beyond just recording. If you're producing an artist and you have a phone call with them and they're talking about, I want this really dark, conceptual, ambient, you know, album, make sure you're writing that down so you can keep track of it. And this way, while you're producing, you can say, am I capturing the darkness? Is this ambient enough? Or whatever it is. This also might help you keep track of things that you're changing between mix passes. You know, let's say you're on version five now and they want to go back to the drums in version two, you can have a written record of all the changes that you made between version two and version five. I think most importantly, it helps keep you focused and make sure that you're paying attention. I've seen plenty of videos of engineers, like, you know, someone's rapping in the booth and I see the engineer in the background, like, on their phone. Or even if you're an assistant, like do I want the assistant that's sitting there paying attention and writing down every move that I'm making, or do I want the guy that's on his phone? I have a number of systems that I use, but I think my favorite is the system that I use when I'm loop recording vocals. I mark the song section on the left, and then every bar or two gets its own square. So as the section loops, I'm marking check for usable, check plus for amazing, that little squiggly for okay, and minus for unusable. This way, once the artist is done, I have a list of all the best takes of each bar that I can comp together without having to listen to 20 minutes of vocals. This way, I also have a running list of options. Sometimes what I think sounds great isn't really what the artist had in mind. So I'll scan for all the check plus, then the check marks. Once we're out of those, we'll go for the squiggles, and if we don't have anything after that, we probably have to punch it again. But at least I know I've checked everything that both I and the artist liked. I'll sometimes even include people's initials next to check marks. So if someone in the room says, oh, that was a good one, make sure you mark that down, I'm gonna put their first initial next to the check so I know who thought what. If the artist stops me, I'll put their initial next to a check mark, and so on and so forth. Tip number four, stay organized and back up often. I can't tell you how many times I've been in the room or an email chain with an artist or a producer, and this happens. Ah, oh, shoot, where's that bounce? I know I saved that project somewhere. Uh, what's that beat called? It's called Sick Beat Version 2 Remaster Version 3 Final Version 2 July 2017. What are you, what are you doing? That, that has no information as to what file you're even looking for. Sick Beat, I mean, all your beats are sick. You're making them, so you... You, version two, final, final, final. The, the only thing that had any information was 2017. Staying organized is key to being successful no matter what industry you're working in. And trust me, if an artist or an engineer asks you for one of their files and you're like, uh, shoot, where'd I save that? They're, they're never gonna contact you ever again. Cause your main job as an engineer is to take care of the files. So the minute you lose a file, your, your trust is gone. Their trust in you is gone. So have a system in place and stick to it. Make sure it's clear and concise and that it's easy to read and easy to follow. Find a way to make all of your files easy to identify and easy to find at a moment's notice, no matter how long ago you worked on them. Every bounce, every rough mix, every mix, every master has my initials in it and a version number. This way I know that it's mine and I know how far back I have to look in my files. And every session that I work in, if it has a bounce, has that version number in the session name. So this way all I have to do is line up the actual file name, let's say it's version one, with the actual session name, also called version one. So I know this file came from this session. This also ensures that I know what the latest version is and the artist knows who they should contact if they need to find this file again. You know, someone actually reached out to me recently looking for a file that I had forgotten to send them. And I said, you know, I, I, I had no recollection of like recording a song with this title, but I said, you know what? Song titles change. Maybe it changed since we recorded on it. Send me the bounce that you have and I'll just go searching on my hard drives. When I got the bounce though, the file was called all capitals, song name, song name version, three, version three, loud mix. Loud mix. That's just not me. This is also why keeping cohesive backups is very important. The song they were looking for was recorded in 2018. So I was able to ensure by looking through all my backups for the last two years that I had this file nowhere on any of my hard drives. My system is that at 4 a.m., my computer does a time machine backup. Once that's done, at 4.30, all my current work gets backed up. So any file that belongs to a client of mine, so you know people I'm producing for, or mixes that I'm doing, or masters that I'm doing, it all gets backed up. Once that's done at 5 a.m., my files get backed up. So any productions that I'm working on for myself, any beats that I'm making, all get backed up. This ensures that I have at least two copies of everyone's files at all times. You know, God forbid, like I'm traveling between studios on the train and someone decides to steal my bag. Tip number five, know your value. So many beginning engineers and producers out there way undervalue their services. Now this is an issue for a number of reasons, but the most important reason is that it makes it so much more difficult for you to focus on your craft and turn it into a career. Many of us start out with lower prices because A, that's what we think we're worth, and B, we want the experience and we're eager to just start working. I can appreciate that, like I, I did the same thing. 
but after a certain point, I started delivering higher and higher quality results, but I was still making the same income. I was afraid that like by even raising my rates just a little bit, I would scare off everyone I was currently working with. Heba Kadri, a mastering engineer you should 100% know, talks about this in her podcast interview with Tapeop. I'll leave a link to that podcast in the description below, but essentially 30 minutes in, she starts talking about the intricacies of keeping your rates affordable while not pricing out anyone that might want to work with you, while also making a living the whole time and also trying to foster like a community of, of artists to work with. Keep in mind also that you have the freedom to maintain flexibility with your pricing. There are times when I can charge a little less because the project might be something that I find really important to me or you know something that I just wanna be a part of in general. There are other times where I find myself having to charge more because things are looking a little disorganized and I can tell it's gonna take a lot more work on my end to get things going. Now I can't tell you what to charge for your services, right? No one can really do that for you. That's a decision that you have to make on your own. But having the confidence to say, you know what? This is what I'm gonna charge because that's what my time and my effort are worth is an important step in taking towards reaching success. Now here's a bonus tip for you all foster a community. Now I mentioned that Hebo talked about this briefly before, but to her point, I cannot stress how important it is to have a community of producers, artists, engineers that can offer you support, but that you can also offer support to in return. Many producers, engineers, artists in the music industry right now are borderline 100% freelancers right now. So having a community of like-minded artists, producers, engineers, you know, around you will help you grow not only more steadily, but more quickly. You know, it's exhilarating and fulfilling to know that like the people around you that you came up with are working and they're successful and that you can like bounce ideas off each other. To that point, I still talk to all the assistants that I worked with back at Red Bull Studios and I haven't worked there since 2018. You know, every week or so we try and catch up. You know, what are you working on? What new gear have you gotten? Uh, who are you mixing right now? Who are you producing right now? Send me a beat. You know, we're exchanging mix notes, we're exchanging ideas and, and talking about gear and, and our new techniques and like we're sharing with each other. But it's also good to know that you have a network of people you can reach out to if you ever need guidance. You know, this way you're not constantly on YouTube looking for tutorials. You know, we're constantly talking about what issues we're having and how we're addressing them and just generally supporting each other's progress. Not only that, but you can actually start to spread the wealth. There will come a time where someone offers you a job and you're too booked, you're not in town but you know somebody who is in town and who's not booked. 10 out of 10 times, I would rather see a friend that I know and trust get that job. There will also be a time where they get called out to do a job and they're not available. You know, you wanna be in their mind. You know, maybe one of your producer friends is looking for a rapper to like feature on one of their beats. Or maybe you you know an artist in LA that needs a mixer and you have a friend in LA or, you know, any, any one of these situations, this happens all the time. Now, I know I've said this before, but I, I'm a firm believer that if you surround yourself with people that push themselves, they will push you to do great things. This is, this is how I live. This is why when people reach out to me with a question, I never turn them away. If you wanna DM me at three in the morning because you're getting this weird buzz on your microphone, let's talk about it. Because that's an opportunity for me to learn also. You know, I really only feel like I'm growing if the people around me are also growing and there to share the experience with me. It's partly why I started making these videos. So if you have anything you'd like to say or share or anything you'd like me to bring up, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. So welcome to the community and I hope to see you next time for a seat at the assistance chair.